Today's subject is a vast one, a critical and central one, and one that we're definitely not going to be able to cover in one sitting, and that is the subject of prophecy. We are trying to work our way through the 13 principles of faith of the Rambam. We have done already five, or we've spoken about five, and now we're up to principle number six, and that is the general idea of prophecy that the Almighty communicates to humanity. Now, as we mentioned a long time back, the 13 principles are three general ideas, three general sections, three general categories, and each one of those are comprised of smaller ideas. So the first five all related to the idea of God. And of course, one of the central pillars of our faith is that the Almighty exists, the Almighty created everything, the Almighty oversees everything, and all the details of that as we enumerated in the first five principles of faith. The four principles that are going to comprise the middle section of the 13 principles are going to orient around Torah and, broadly speaking, prophecy. Of course, the Torah, given to us by Moshe, Moshe is legitimized as a prophet, as we shall see. Thus, the idea of Torah, the fact that we have a divine Torah, that is a testament to the concept that the Almighty communicates to us directly via prophets. And thus, there are four principles that fall fall under that general category. Principle number six, the concept of prophecy in general. Number seven, the idea of the primacy of mosaic prophecy, that Moshe's prophet, Moshe is a different kind of prophet than all the other prophets. And that's why Moshe and Moshe alone gives us Torah. You know, we have 24 books in the Jewish quote-unquote Bible, the Tanakh. The first five of them are the Torah, and we have 613 mitzvos. All of them are found in the Torah. The subsequent 19 books have zero mitzvos. So they had the talk about mitzvos, but there's no commandments that are part of the 613 that are conveyed in those 19 books. Why? Because Moshe and Moshe alone, with his heightened level of prophecy, and we'll talk about that, of course, and the details of that. He's the one who gives us the Torah. He's that high-level prophet that can be that bridge between the upper realms and and us, and no one else can actually fulfill that role. And therefore, there's prophecy in general. There is the supremacy, the primacy of, of Moshe's prophecy. And then principle number eight is the concept of the divinity of the Torah, of course, a very central a central pillar of of Torah in general. And principle number nine is going to orient around the transmission of the Torah, namely the Torah we have today is the same Torah that Moshe got at Sinai, the same Torah that the Almighty delivered to Moshe. And today we're going to begin, of course, with principle number six, and that's the idea of prophecy in general. And, you know, if you think about it, it does have an intimate connection to the ideas that we've left off in the 13 principles, discussions that we've had till now, namely that the Almighty is not severed from this world. Not only is the Almighty involved in our lives, he answers our prayers, he's manipulating events to to uh, orient our lives around, but moreover, he's going to give us this very intimate, very deep connection by speaking to us, by sending us prophets that are going to show us the way to live give us Torah, guide us, reprimand us when needed. We're going to be given the tools to perfect ourselves in this world. And these four principles are all necessary for that to be true. Prophecy in general, the primacy of Moshe's prophecy, the divinity of the Torah at its genesis, at its origination, we got it. And the fact that we still have the Torah today, the Torah today that we have is still accurate. And as we mentioned, this is a very vast subject. We're not going to become prophets in one day. I made the joke before. I'll say it again. It always elicits a good laughter. It's something that we know very little about. In fact, I myself work for a nonprofit organization. The Jewish people, we've been without any prophets for 2,300 some odd years. And therefore, we're going to have to follow the guidance of the Rambam, what prophecy was, how it was achieved, how do we verify, what about false prophets, what happens to false prophets. It's a very multifaceted subject. 
And what we're going to cover today is more introductory, and we're going to orient our discussion around discussing what the Rambam, who is, of course, our guide in understanding the principles of Torah, what he writes vis-a-vis prophets and prophecy. So I think a good place to start is by clearing away the most glaring and egregious of misconceptions vis-a-vis prophecy. The common perception of prophecy, most common perceptions are wrong, this one is particularly egregious, and it's made its way into not only the world at large, the, the, the perception of prophecy at large, but also even in amongst the Jewish people, there are some people that still harbor this erroneous belief, and that is that prophecy is a spiritual lottery. Someone just wakes up one day and says, well, the Almighty spoke to me, I'm a prophet, I'm going to tell you what you need to do, etc. That is a theme that apparently is not new, because the Rambam, when he talks about prophecy, he says that there is this misconception that exists in his time. The fools believe that the Almighty is just going to arbitrarily dispense prophecy. That someone is an ordinary person one day, the next day they wake up, they're a prophet, and they're starting to give advice, supposedly, allegedly, from God. And these people, says the Rambam, this is not viewed as something that you earn, and therefore the prophet could be really wise. But the prophet could also be very foolish, because after all, it's a lottery. Who knows who wins the lottery? Sometimes more fools win the lotteries, right? You can have a very, really young prophet. You can have a really advanced in age prophet. You can have someone that maybe would seem to be spiritually, characteristically worthy of it, and someone that's totally not worthy of it at all. But if it's random, if it's a lottery, if it's arbitrarily selected, if it's dispensed like gumballs, then who knows who can get prophecy? Really, everyone can. And that is, of course, wrong. And the Rambam actually uses a very clever line. He says that a fool, someone who's not qualified to be a prophet, is as likely to have prophecy as a donkey or a fraud do. This is the actual citation for the Rambam. So that's the first misconception to clear away. So if a fool cannot have prophecy, then who can? And what is the avenue? What is the pathway? What is the portal through which someone can become a prophet? What is the prophecy 101? The idiot's guide to prophecy. Maybe not an idiot. The uneducated guide or the uninitiated guide or prophecy for dummies. What, what, what is the basics of how to become a prophet? So the Ram tells us in the laws of the foundations of Torah, chapter 7, 7, 8, 9, and 10, the last four chapters of the first section of the laws that the Rambam codifies for us, he talks about prophecy and he tells us as follows. One of the foundations of our religion is to know that God will prophesy to humans. Then he tells us, and prophecy only rests on a great scholar. That's the first characteristic. That's necessary. First precondition. Who is mighty in character? Whose Yetzirah does not overpower him in any matter in the world. Rather, he always overpowers his Yetzirah with his willpower and one who possesses exceedingly broad and correct knowledge. From gives us here three preconditions. You got to be someone who's tremendously uh, scholastically advanced. Someone who is, who you know, who has the strength of character, the moral, the moral fortitude to always overcome his yetzara and never capitulate to it, and someone who is possessing exceedingly broad and correct knowledge. Someone like that. In addition, the Ram tells us he has all the good characteristics. He is also perfect in his body. He's also physically perfect. When this person enters the orchard, and the orchard is euphemism for the advanced areas that we dance around or we really avoid in our discussions, it's the, what we call colloquially the Kabbalah, and he is drawn in those matters, in those great and distant matters, and he has the proper knowledge to understand and to absorb, and he becomes holy 
and he progressively advances and he becomes an ascetic who abstains from this world and its pleasures. And he does not follow the flow of the rest of humanity who walk in the darkness of the time, his words. Instead, he is always continuously growing and advancing and ensuring that he has not a single thought of matters that are not meaningful. He's totally in control of himself that none of his thoughts are going to wander on things that don't matter. And nothing, not, none of his thoughts are going to focus on the the temporal ideas and the, the small matters of this world. Rather, his mind is completely focused above, tied underneath the throne of God to understand in those matters. And he only focuses on, on the godly wisdom. Right away, when someone has all these preconditions, the divine inspiration will settle upon them. And at that time, his spirit is going to be mixed with the angels. Obviously, when we're reading this description, we're like, oh, okay, count me out, right? I'm not a candidate. Right? This is very advanced, very advanced. But then this is the introduction, right? But again, it does give us the sense that this is not something that can be achieved overnight. Obviously, not a spiritual lottery. And it makes sense to us that this, this kind of level of, of spiritual perfection is already extinct for many centuries. And this person will be transformed into a different person and will understand as well that he's had this metamorphosis and he'll know that he's above the rest of the people. He'll realize his his supremacy. I want to unpack what the Ramam is telling us here. He gives us a description of someone who's really changing themselves in a very fundamental way, transforming themselves reframing themselves, refashioning themselves into a new person. He's becoming like an angel. He's involved with the angels. Again, the premise of prophecy is someone's having communication with God. It's an amazing thing. The God is from the heavenly realm. It's totally spiritual. What are we? We're like uh, intelligent, sentient animals, right? Is that what we are? How could there be an interplay, an interface between these two worlds? What the Ram is revealing to us, he said, he's saying it almost explicitly, but it's definitely implied from his words. Man can have communication with God. However, this is something which when you hear it, you're like, yeah, of course, but it's something that we don't necessarily assign to prophecy. And this is going to, this is going to kind of make a lot of the other subsequent things that the Ram is going to tell us fall into place. Man is capable of communicating with God. However, as we've spoken about numerous times before, man is a fusion of opposites. You get the body. If you just have a body, man is a pretty lousy animal. But we also have the soul. If you just have the soul, man is a pretty special angel. And those two opposites are fused together. Man can communicate with God. However, this communication, this interface this flow of divine inspiration that can be that can descend upon man is not man's body and God. It's quite the contrary. That is a nary those two shall meet. It of course man's body is a creation of God, but it, these things are one's totally spiritual, one's totally physical, one's totally mundane. There's no there's no commonality between those two. However, we have a soul. And we know that our soul is the thing that's really most similar to God in, in all of existence. Our soul is like the angels. Our soul, the Talmud tells us lots of things where our soul is similar to God. Our body is totally dissimilar to God. Our soul is totally similar. Again, it's also a creation. Now, let's not make that mistake. Our, our soul is not a creator. Our soul is a creation. But our soul is a creation that's very similar or s- much more similar to God than our body. When we're talking about man communicating with God, we're talking about man becoming a different person, physiologically changing themselves. Man becoming a soul, becoming an angel, shedding themselves of their body like it just Ram tells us. Someone who's not subject to the Eight Sarah, always overcoming the Eight Sarah. Not at all subject to the force trying to convince us that we're a body. 
not involved in any of the petty matters of the body's world. Someone who is totally, his mind is totally focused on the spiritual world. That's someone who is living their life as a soul. Someone who is living their life as a soul, okay, the more they become like a soul, they're turning into a different person, a person who is capable of divine communication. And maybe the subplot of this is that man is and always was a prophet. It's just that many other things were thrown into the cauldron that weakened, impaired, disrupted man's ability to be that prophet. You always had the soul. The prophet always had the soul. That other person was always present. It was just latent. It was hidden under a mound of all kinds of other schmutz. By unearthing the soul, you're changing yourself fundamentally and you're actually harnessing that prophetic power that was always there within you. I want to point out something. Our sages tell us that a lot of things happen to the soul before it's entered into a body. But one of the things that is constantly happening to the soul before conception and before birth is prophecy. Everyone who's hearing this has already prophesied because if you're alive, if you're a human, you have a soul. And the soul has experienced prophecy before. Prophecy is no big deal for the soul. The problem is, is that we have all kinds of other things that are contaminating our soul and therefore we may be a prophet, but that's as helpful as a radio antenna covered by 500 miles of steel. It's not going to be a very good receptor to communicate with the messages, so to speak. And someone who's changing themselves, they're, they're like unearthing their radio receptor, their antenna from within. They're getting rid of all the other stuff that are distracting from that, that are counteracting that, and they're exposing the, the prophet that was always already alive within them. The human body is incapable of communicating with God. That's not going to happen. In fact, the human body is engineered to go – to counteract it, to resist prophecy. Prophecy is communication with the prophet's soul. If we could theoretically isolate our soul from other elements of our existence, it would immediately experience prophecy. That's what the realms – we're digging into this. We're dipping our toe in. He's describing a process – which is similar to the whole Torah's process. The Torah is telling us, you're a soul. Remember that. Do the mitzvahs. Act like a soul. Don't do the sins which reinforce your identity as a body. Someone who does that to the nth degree, someone who puts that on steroids and superpowers, is someone who is actually changing themselves and recreating themselves as a new person, a person that was always existing theoretically within them, but a new person that did not exist prior, a soul, an angel, their spirit is involved with the angels, and that's how they become a prophet. And as we shall see, the Rams are going to continue to delineate the nature of prophecy. We'll see more about what that entails. So let's continue what the Ram tells us. He tells us that there are many different levels of prophecy. Just as within wisdom, there's a wise person. And there's a different wise person, and one of them is wiser than the other. Maybe there's – how many levels of wisdom are there? How many different kinds of wisdom are there? It's infinite. Similarly, that's the way it is with prophecy too. And we would say that the strength of the prophetic signal that someone can absorb, well, that hinges on the extent to which a prophet actually remove the disruptors of their prophecy. How strong is their soul within them? How weak are the things that are counteracting the soul and therefore how much of a connection can they potentially have? Now, I want to point out, even if someone is totally capable of prophecy, there could be factors that are not under the control that would disallow them from having prophecy. So, for example, the Ramam says that you have to be physically healthy. Suppose someone is spiritually primed for prophecy but not physically primed for prophecy. We find out that they're actually not a good candidate. In addition, we find out, and this is something that appears many times at the Torah, 
that someone has to be in a setting that's proper, proper for prophecy. So for example, we just read about Abraham. Abraham had a sidekick named Lot. And we find out in last week's parsha that whenever Lot's around him, Abraham doesn't, Abraham doesn't have prophecy. And right when Lot leaves, there's prophecy immediately endowed upon Abraham. Similarly, we find out in Exodus, Moses doesn't have prophecy when he's in the city, in the urban area. In Egypt, he has to go outside. And every time he goes outside, that's when he has a prophecy because the setting has to be conducive to, to the prophecy. In addition, we find out Jacob, after Joseph dies, we know he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't die actually, but Jacob thinks he dies. For those 22 years before Jacob discovers that Joseph is still alive, Jacob is despondent. He's sad and thus not capable of prophecy. So again, we find that there's other conditions when someone becomes incapable of prophecy, not necessarily of their own doing. But what the Ram is describing to us is someone who has to fundamentally change himself to turn to a different person to be someone who, a person who is capable of prophecy. And then he tells us, all the prophets, and I want to add, this is with the exception of Moses, because that's going to be principle number seven is going to be, well, Moses is different. The rule, all the rules that are applied to regular prophets don't apply to Moses. But all the prophets, they only see their vision of prophecy at night, in a dream, in a vision at night, or by day, provided that they fall into a deep slumber. Also, all the prophets, when they prophesy, they have their entire body is convulsing, and the strength of the body weakens, and they get totally frazzled. And that way they could focus their mind to see, to experience what they can experience. What he's revealing to us is you can take a prophet and turn him into a different person. But you know what they're still? They're still a human. They still have a body, still have a Yetzirah. They still have things about them that are antithetical to prophecy. And thus, for someone to prophesy, someone to have prophecy, there is, there is friction, there is tension between the things within them that are resisting prophecy and the things within them that are embracing it. And the body, we'll call it the body or the Yetzirah, is going to be interfering with the prophetic signals conveyed to the soul. So what has to happen? The body needs to be mitigated. You've got to put the body to sleep. You have to have the parts of the person's existence that are resisting it. Either you have to weaken them, you have to mitigate them, or you have to, you have to placate them. So for example, we're going to read in next week's Parsha, we're going to read about Isaac. It's a very unusual narrative. Isaac wants to have prophecy to give a blessing to his son, Esau. Esau. So what does he do? He says, well, I want to have a steak. Not not any steak. You have to kill the animal right now, fresh, fresh, fresh. Now, to us, that sounds bizarre. Why would someone trying to get a prophecy to give a prophetic blessing, why would that be included? Like, why why would the preparation for that to be to have a steak dinner? Didn't the Ram just, just, just now tell us that prophecy is all about resisting this world? The answer is, is that Isaac was one of the greatest heroes of, of all history. But you know what Isaac still had? He still had a body. And the body is still going to resist the prophecy. And Isaac wants to do this prophecy when he's awake. So what's the body going to say? Uh, 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 over my dead body. This ain't happening. If the body was dead, it wouldn't be a problem. But the body's up and it says no to the prophecy. So what Isaac would do He would try to placate the body, to bribe, to assuage the body, to throw it a bone, to get it on board to the spiritual ecstasy of the soul. The soul wants to ascend to heaven. The body is kind of dead weight pulling it down. How do you get the body to endorse it? You throw it a bone. You make it happy, so to speak, in the ascension of the soul. King David, we're told, did the same thing with music. He would take the music as a means to bring the body onto this journey that the soul is taking to achieve prophecy. And even when the prophecy is able to power through the recalcitrant body, 
we find that the bo- that the person suffers weakness. He starts convulsing, them, but the body still can't handle it. Yes, the prophecy is going to batter through, but it's not going to be a pleasant experience because there is still something that's counteracting this experience. In addition, we're told that what the prophet has shown, he has shown in images and in hints. And thus, the prophecy is conveyed in two parts. There is A, the vision, what you, what the prophet sees. And B, what that actually means. What is the lesson? What is the, what is the way to decode, to decrypt the riddle of the vision? So he gives examples. Uh, we know we'll read in a couple of weeks in Genesis. We'll read about Jacob having a dream and he sees a ladder that his roots are, its roots are in, in, in terra firma, goes up to heaven. Angels are going up and down. Torah tells us that vision. And we know that that's a prophetic vision and it has its meaning. And the Rambam tells us, and of course the sources explain what is the message. The message is the kings and the history of the Jewish people and the ups and downs of the vicissitudes of, of our history. So again, we have the vision, the image, what you see and what it means. Similarly, it talks about the chayos, the, the visions of Ezekiel or the bloated pot and the almond rod of Jeremiah, or the scroll of Ezekiel, etc. And then he adds, when we get descriptions of prophecy, sometimes we get both, both what they actually saw and what it means. Sometimes we get just the lesson. And there's a deep point here. When Abraham was told, go sacrifice your son, we just get it the way it's actually decoded. We get the decoded version of the prophecy. We just get, Abraham, you're told, go sacrifice your son on Mount Moriah, right? But that's what we're told. What Abraham got was a vision. And that was decoded in that way. And in fact, I want to point out, one of the commentaries tells us that, you know, the test, the greatest test of Abraham is that he was told to go offer his son as a sacrifice and he didn't question that. He did it unquestioningly. Is that such a great test? If God tells you to do something, it may sound ludicrous, but who wouldn't do it? Who would disobey? What's so special about Abraham's test? And the answer, or one of the answers given, is this point. Abraham was given a vision, and he had to interpret what the vision was. And of course, as every loving father knows, nothing is more important to a parent than the well-being of their child. And therefore, the test of Abraham was not to obey or disobey the directive of God, but it was, how are you going to interpret the vision? Maybe the vision was ambiguous enough that Abraham could have just as easily interpreted it slightly differently, and that was the test. Are you going to allow your inherent bias of a love of your, of your son, is that going to cloud your judgment when you are tasked with decrypting, decoding the message of God that is somewhat ambiguous. Really interesting. So some prophecies, when they're conveyed to us, that we're told both the vision and what it portends. Sometimes we're told just the meaning, and sometimes we're told just the vision. And of course, we don't have the tools, we're not prophets, to actually decrypt it. And that's why it sounds maybe like gibberish to us when we read about certain prophecies. Okay, that's interesting. Continues the Rambam. All the prophets are not capable of summoning prophecy. So suppose you're a prophet. You're all ready to go. You have your soul isolated. You're, you've totally weakened your body. You've overcome the HR. You've done, you've done everything. Now what? Where do I press the button? How do I initiate prophecy? The answer is you can't. You could prepare yourself. You could prime yourself. But of course, it's in the decision-making ability of God to determine whether and when and under what conditions you actually receive that prophecy. You have to make yourself ready for it, put yourself in the right mood. Like we mentioned earlier, you can't be sad. You have to be joyous. You take the steps to prepare yourself, 
But ultimately, it's possible you'll have it, and it's possible that you won't have it. And continues the Rambam, all these things that we described, all these limitations on prophecy are all true with all the prophets, with the exception of Moshe, Moshe, our master, the father of all the prophets. Different rules apply to him, and that'll be the subject, of course, of principle number seven, the primacy of Moshe's prophecy and the difference between Moshe's prophecy versus all the other prophets. Okay, suppose you're a prophet and you're all ready to go and indeed you receive prophecy. What is the nature of the content of that prophecy? So again, it guides us the Rambam. He tells us, it's possible that the prophecy will be just for you. You're after all a great scholar, a great sage, a highly righteous person. You're someone who you're, you know, have involved in very advanced ideas. And sometimes Yomari will just give you prophecy because he wants to increase your wisdom, increase your insight, increase your knowledge. And it's just for you. It's just relevant for you. And no one needs to know about it. It's just your communion with God. In addition, there's a different kind of prophecy, which is prophecy when someone is sent on a mission by God to go inform, direct, guide, reprimand, reproach the masses, give them rebuke, castigate them, guide them, encourage them. It's to be a spokesman, so to speak, of God, an ambassador of God, conveying his messages to the people. I want to point out the Talmud tells us that over the course of our history, we've had prophets more than double of those people who exited Egypt. So we have 600,000 people leave Egypt. We have more than double that. So we're talking about millions of prophets. And of course, we know the names of a lot of prophets, but if you count all the names of all the prophets that we know, it's around 50. So there are many, many, many more prophets whose names we don't know, whose stories we don't know, whose accounts we don't have a record of than the ones that we do know of. And that, of course, is testament to the fact that a a prophecy is a a certain stature that you achieve and a certain endowment that you get if if you are worthy and meritorious to be deserving of that. But it's not necessarily something which needs to be perpetuated, which is included in our text, which is included in our canon, in our Bible, if you will. It's not necessarily something that we would know about today. And he adds that, obviously, when there is a prophet – that's there to convey a message to the masses, that, of course, carries with it the risk of the charlatan. That's the idea of the false prophet, someone who is masquerading as a real prophet when truly they are nothing but a charlatan, they're a faker. And because prophecy has within it the potential of corruption, of abuse, there has to be a means of vetting a prophet Of course, if someone is just a private prophet, they're profiteering on their own, that doesn't – we may not even know about that. But if someone is a public prophet, if someone is prophesying and telling us to do X, Y, or Z, as we shall see, if the prophet tells you to desecrate Shabbos, you have to listen to the prophet because he says this is a one-time event. The Mahdi tells me to tell you that you have to do this and this and that. Even if it's to desecrate, to violate to transgress one of the mitzvahs, we are obligated to listen to them. Now, important to note, that's only if it's a one-time thing and if it's not the sin of idolatry. So every other sin, yes, but not idolatry. If a prophet comes to tell you to do idolatry, that's for sure a false prophet. Or if a prophet comes to tell you that one of the 613 mitzvahs is forever annulled. Those two are signs of the false prophet. But if Elijah comes and tells you that today we can offer a sacrifice on Mount Carmel, even though we can only offer sacrifices in all other times on Mount Moriah, on Temple Mount, Elijah is a public prophet. He's a legitimate prophet. He's a verified prophet. He's a prophet who has been vetted, and therefore we have to listen to him. But there has to be some sort of process where the public prophet is indeed verified as being legitimate because their power is vast, their influence is is great, and the mandate that we have to listen to them is, is total, is complete. 
So the, so the Ram tells us that when someone is sent to be a public prophet, they're also given the means to verify that. Now, it's important to stress, the Ram tells us, that when someone comes and says, I am a public prophet, I have a message from you, and I also have a way of verifying that I'm legitimate, when someone comes and tells us that, if they're a legitimate prophet, in all likelihood, we would, or the community, or the court, or the powers that be, would all already have a hunch that this this person is probably a prophet. After all, to be a prophet, you have to be very noteworthy in your kindness, your character, and your scholarship, and your asceticism. To be a prophet is not just about prophecy. That, that, that's part of a long-term growth of the prophet. So someone who's coming to us and telling us about their prospective prophecy, we already should know that they're a very good candidate for such a role, for such a responsibility. And in fact, the law is if some simpleton, if some fool, if someone that we know does not have refined character, they show up and say, I'm a prophet, we know they're a false prophet. We don't even need to listen to them. We don't need to inspect them. That's it. They're a false prophet. But someone who does have the goods, who does have the credentials to be a prophet, they're claiming to be a public prophet, we have to verify them. We have to examine them. We have to vet them. And what do we do? And then we're told by the Rambam what to do. Every prophet who stands up and says that God sent them, he doesn't need to do a miracle on the scale of Moses' miracle. So again, this is part of the idea that Moses, everything about Moses is on a different level. He doesn't do a Moses-like miracle or even an Elisha-like miracle. We don't say to him, okay, here's the sea, go split the sea. Here's the bayou, go split the bayou. We don't say that. Rather, what we say is, okay, you're a prophet. Predict the future and we'll wait to see the future happening if it is indeed as you predict. If there is even a slight variation between what the prophet prescribed and what actually happened, we know for sure they're a false prophet because prophecy is precise. If the Almighty is going to give them a tool to predict the future, to legitimize their prophecy, it's going to be a hundred million percent accurate. Nothing is going to be lacking from their prediction. And he tells us we actually ask them a lot of things. A lot of times we com- we continuously, rigorously vet them to make sure that they are legitimate. And if indeed they're constantly predicting the future. And every time they do it, it's 100% accurate that we know, behold, this person is a true prophet. And the Ram goes on to talk about, well, this seems like like a shoddy way to do it. After all, aren't there necromancers and stargazers that also have clairvoyance to tell the future? What's the difference between a true prophet and those necromancers and stargazers? So he tells us that there is a difference. Number one, that... Of course, the prophet is someone who has the character, has the credentials. But also, whenever you have someone who is clairvoyant, who tells the future, but is not a real prophet, then yes, they may be able to predict the future. But some things will happen. Some things won't exactly happen. And you know what? It's possible that nothing that they foretell will actually happen. Whereas a legitimate prophet, we're told, every single word that they say is precisely going to happen because after all, this is part of the message of God. Go convey the public prophecy and I'm also going to give you the sign, the miracle to prove the credentials of your prophecy. And he gives an analogy that, you know, whenever you have a mixture of of wheat and straw, of course, you want the wheat and the straw is the chaff that you want to get rid of. Most people are a mixed bag. There's a little bit of wheat, a little bit of a straw, the prophet is 100,000% wheat and none of the extra stuff that are waste. And the Ramam adds an interesting point. This is controversial amongst his contemporaries. But like we said in the past, the Ramam has emerged, so to speak, as the voice on these matters. He says that if you look at Deuteronomy, 
Deuteronomy, we're told that the Jewish nation, we go to the real prophets. We don't go to the necromancers and the fortune tellers and the stargazers. And what the Ram draws from that is that everyone wants to know the future. The question is, are you going to use a legitimate avenue to find the future or are you going to use an illegitimate avenue to find the future? When you go to a prophet, you may go to the prophet for the same reasons that your non-Jewish neighbor, that your pagan neighbor goes to the fortune teller. It could be simple petty things even. He gives an example. When King Saul, before he was king, he was just Saul, he went to visit Samuel. It's because he lost something. Samuel was a prophet. He wanted to know, where is my lost items? That's what he wanted to know. That's why you go to the prophet? That sounds petty. Well, yes, it could be petty, but that's the boon of the prophecy is that you don't need those little tiles to be able to find out where your stuff is. I lost my keys. I lost my phone. Did anyone see this? Did anyone see that? You just go to the prophet and the prophet, again, has that clairvoyance because of their prophecy and your neighbor will go to the necromancer for that. You may go to the prophet for that as well. And of course, on more broader things, you know, today, a lot of us grapple with the question, what really is my responsibility in life? What, what's my calling in life? What should I really focus on? What, what must I accomplish? What's my mission? That question we have today, we would not have it if we had a prophet because you would just go to the prophet and the prophet would say, this is your mission. Go do it. This is your mission. Just see right through you, be able to see exactly what, what your mandate is, what you're tasked with, with, with accomplishing in this world. I, that was a very valuable thing. But even the little things, the things that the common folk would go to the necromancers, we would go to the prophet for. And the Ram adds something interesting. So the prophet is told, predict the future. Of course, the future could be good, could be bad. He could be giving us a foreboding, ominous take on what's going to happen. Or it could be very pleasant, very positive. Says the Rambam, and you know, this is found in the source in, in, in the Torah and the Talmud everywhere. You only vet the prophet with good tidings, with positive prophecies to the future. Never for negative things. So, so he tells you, hey, next week your house is going to burn down. And you know what? It doesn't burn down. We may say is that, well, yes, your house was supposed to burn down, but you repented, but you prayed. And you know what? You changed the destiny that was supposed to happen. And that does not disqualify the credentials of that prophet. However, when an edict, a positive edict is conveyed to you, and under almost all circumstances, when something good is foretold, it is not rescinded, it's never rescinded. Therefore, we only vet the prophet when they convey good things and those things either happen and they're proved to be a legitimate prophet, provided that they do it sufficiently, su- sufficient times, or we find out that they're, they're a fraud, they're fake, if that does not happen. He gives an example. Uh, Jonah goes to the people of Nineveh. He tells them the city is going to be destroyed. The city is not destroyed. We know Jonah is a legitimate prophet. It's because they repented and thus they were able to avoid the destiny that would have happened to them had they not repented. I want to add another point that we go to the real prophet. We don't go to the fake ones. We don't go to the people who are the gurus, who are the fortune tellers, the palm readers. We we go to the Torah. We go to the prophets. That's one of the descriptions we're told in, in Deuteronomy. But if you do go to these people, I'll tell you one of their tricks. One of the tricks that they use is they – they predict the future or they predict the past or they they, know, they see right through you. That's because they speak in very general terms. You could say something to a person that is true for every person you speak to. Like you say the following, I see you're really going through something important. That's true for everyone because that one is able to it's, – it's too vague. It could be interpreted as true for every person. You could also say the following – you know that you have squandered potential. And anytime you really set your mind to something, invariably you accomplish it. 
Like, yeah, it was like, yeah, nod, yeah, ooh, right? That's the, that's one of the tricks of the snake oil salesman to say things that are so general, but people interpret as being, wow, they, re- he read me like an open book. It's, no, it's just everyone's got that open book and I'll just reveal that to you. That's the secret. The prophet has to give specific predictions. Like, it's going to rain tomorrow afternoon, you know, at 4.43 p.m. If it starts raining at 4.42 p.m., or 4.44 p.m., false prophet. You may even have to execute them. It has to be precise, exactly precise, that the good tiding of rain for our crops will arrive. And the Ramam adds, this is how he concludes his laws that relate to prophecy, that there is another way to be verified if you have a verified prophet who uh, vouches for an unverified prophet, then you don't need to verify prophet number two because prophet number one vouched for them. So for example, he says that Moses, Moshe, vouched for Joshua and without inspecting Joshua, the whole nation accepted him as a legitimate prophet because Moshe vouched for him. I will add that Moshe also vouched for Abraham. How do we know? How do we believe that, that Abraham is a prophet? It's because Moshe told us and Moshe was verified. Moshe was vetted, and therefore, because Moshe tells us that Abraham is a prophet, ergo, we know that Abraham indeed is a prophet. And this applies not just with Moses and Joshua, for all of history, if there is a verified prophet that, again, we tested multiple times and is behaving like a prophet, we cannot question him, we cannot try to question the legitimacy of his prophecy. Maybe it's not true. We, we know once he's verified as a legitimate prophet, we believe him. If he points to this person and says, this person is also a legitimate prophet, that person is right away elevated to that status. However, we don't test him too much. Test him a lot, a lot, but not too, too much. Never like like Samuel. He's, he's proven ready to be a legitimate prophet. We don't test him anymore. Rather, we believe that the Almighty is going to give us these special people amongst us to be a tremendous boon for us, but also a conduct that we have with the Almighty, and therefore we ought not to question them, and and we we ought not to ask too many questions from them once they've already been legitimately verified. So this is this could serve maybe as a general introduction to the concept of prophecy, the idea that the Almighty is connected to us in such a visceral, intimate way that there are these special people to whom they've earned the right to become someone who is worthy of prophecy, they've isolated their soul, they've cleansed their soul, they've elevated their soul to the degree that the soul has much fewer inhibitors to its connection with God. God decides that they're worthy and indeed he communicates with them. That is the idea of prophecy. And of course, we know that prophecy does not exist anymore today. There is a very very dramatic description in the Talmud as to when, where, why it ended. We're going to talk about that in a future session. Uh, but more general concepts of prophecy, the roles of, for example, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob in, in prophecy, the stature that they had, and some of the other questions related to this vast subject are, are the topics of our future immersions into the 30 principles of faith of the Rambam. I thank you all for listening. My email address again is rabbiwolbe.gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you.